welcome to the History Lord. You join us here. Once again, we're at the uh, junction of Northumberland Avenue and the Embankment. And uh, we're talking about what's behind us today. This is now the Corinthia Hotel. But it started its life off as the Metropole. And uh, between the Metropole and the Corinthia, it had a very chequered history. So this is its story. Welcome to London. The original Metropole Hotel was commissioned by the Gordon Hotels Company. The hotel opened in 1885 with a magnificent 88-page brochure that proudly claimed the hotel's location is particularly recommended to ladies and families visiting the West End during the season, to travellers from Paris and the continent, arriving from Dover and Folkestone at the Charing Cross Terminus, to officers and others attending the levees at St James's to ladies going to the drawing rooms, state balls and concerts at Buckingham Palace, and to colonial and American visitors unused to the great world of London. The hotel quickly became a venue for annual dinners of lots of prestigious clubs and the gathering point for the first London to Brighton car run in 1896. Uh, that now starts in Hyde Park every year. The Prince of Wales, later who's King Edward VII, entertained his guests at the hotel, on many occasions and he had a reserved box in the ballroom that was used as a royal suite. Just before the run-up to the First World War the hotel was requisitioned to provide accommodation for government staff. It wasn't the only hotel, I think the other hotels along Northumberland Avenue were also uh, requisitioned including the Constitutional Club. It was also the place where the night before the British Expeditionary Force uh, went to France at the outbreak of World War I in August of 1914, the two commanders-in-chief, Field Marshals John French and Douglas Haig, both stayed in that building. It reopened as a hotel in the 1920s and became very famous for its cabaret. Now, when the government developed some buildings along Whitehall Gardens in the mid-1930s, they leased the entire hotel for a massive £300,000 a year, and this provided alternative accommodation for the Ministry of Labour, the Ministry of Transport and later the Air Ministry and the Ministry of War. They were about to hand the building back, but the government again leased it and requisitioned the building uh, on the build-up to World War II. Again, it was home to various government departments, but this is where the plot thickens. Room 424 became the first home for MI9, and a subdivision of MI9 was a Special Operations Executive. Now, what was a Special Operations Executive? Well, in June of 1940, a new volunteer force was set up to wage a secret war. The agents were mainly tasked with sabotaging and subverting behind the enemy lines. They did have a very influential supporter, and that was the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. And he famously ordered them to set Europe ablaze. The SOE was under the operations directorship of a commando officer called Brigadier Colin Gubbins. Gubbins' approach to warfare included blowing up trains and bridges and the odd factory, and as well as fostering revolutions and guerrilla warfare in occupied countries. The SOE executive agents completed a gruelling training regime and they were then parachuted into occupied Europe and eventually the Far East to work with resistance movements. Lots were serving soldiers often with commando training, but some joined directly from civilian life. Women were also allowed to join up, and they were enlisted as a cover in the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, and this disguised their secret war work. And these were the only women permitted in a combat role during the Second World War. Now, one of the people who joined the Special Operations Executive was a chap called Major Dennis Rake. And he was a gay man, and he was actually a drag artist as well, and an actor. And here is his little story, which is fascinating. Churchill recruited him because he said, as a gay man, he knew how to hide in plain sight. Dennis Rake had a colourful upbringing. His father was a Times correspondent during the First World War, and he also supplied fake papers to Edith Cavell, the nurse. There's another video all about Cavell elsewhere on the channel. Dennis Rake's mother was a Welsh singer, an opera singer, and he was born in Brussels whilst his father was working there as a correspondent. In 1905, his mother entrusted Dennis to the Sarazani Circus, 
and throughout his childhood he travelled through Europe. And from 1920 to 1923, uh, he travelled with an English diplomat who fell in love with him. And he took him as far as Athens. That's where they separated, sadly. Rake then had, we believe, an affair with the prince of the Greek royal family, who maintained him, but then entered into politics and became the target of the opposition. Rake went to Venice, and then he came back to England. And for 15 years, he starred in musicals. And he reached a professional climax in the role of Mary Mercenary. Now, before the war, Dennis worked as an actor, and in June 1939, he left the cast of Ivan Novello's The Dancing Years to begin his military career with the RASC as a translator. His wartime experience before the SOE was also eventful. He was successfully evacuated with the British Expeditionary Force from Dunkirk in June of 1940, only to find himself on board the liner Lancastria, which was attacked and sunk by an enemy aircraft. He survived, and on his return to England was transferred to the RNVR, and Dennis survived another sinking while serving on board a French minesweeper. But his enthusiasm for dangerous assignments didn't waver. In an interview he gave many years later, Dennis explained that part of the reason he felt was the need to prove himself and test the limits of his courage. And that came from his anxieties he felt about his homosexuality. Now, Dennis was fluent in French and in Morse code, and that's what led him to the Special Operations Executive. Now, this was in spite of him being considered a trifle effeminate and a drug addict. Well, his drug addiction was nothing more than a reliance on sleeping pills. But the SOE badly needed people for dangerous situations and missions in France that was now Nazi-occupied. Whilst he was there, Dennis Rake's cover was as a cabaret artist in Paris as a drag act. He was captured, held in the concentration camp and escaped. And if you want to read more about him, he wrote a book that was called Rake's Progress. And I think it was published in about 1968. There's no doubt that Dennis was a courageous man and for his efforts, he won not only the Military Cross, he was also awarded the Croix de Guerre avec Palme and also made a Chevalier of the Légion d'Honneur. After the war, he became a butler to the film star Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Dennis died in 1976 and he asked for donations from his estate to be made to the Campaign for Homosexual Equality. Let's go back to the building. Gordon Hotels uh, sold the company after World War II and it was transferred to the Crown Estates. It was controlled by the Ministry of War, now called the Ministry of Defence, who used it as an overflow building for its main Whitehall complex. I think it was the early 1950s that the Air Ministry were again the major occupant. From the mid-1960s until the early 1990s, it housed a bulk of the Defence Intelligence staff, and the remainder of the staff, I believe, were Ministry of Defence. In 2004, the government finally left, and uh, it was left unattended for, I think, three years, until 2007, and I think in 2008 it was bought by a hotel company for around about £130 million, and it was converted and opened as the Corinthia Hotel in 2011. Now, a slight confession to make, both James and myself have worked in there in various capacities. James has filmed a few corporate events, is that right? Yeah, yeah a few corporate events he's filmed. And uh, I've appeared as a certain chap in, uh, in a red suit with a big beard in there for a few corporate events as well. But there you go, just full disclosure for you. They're not paying us, we just like to be honest. Anyway, that's the video for today. Thanks for watching, we do hope you enjoy these videos. If you do, please subscribe and tell your friends. If you want to see what we do outside these videos, please go to historylord.co.uk, see about the walking tour of London, or have a look for James's channels, and they're called Last Line Films. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you very soon. Take care.